Hello, my name is William Bell with Chesapeake Net Craftsman, and today we are going to review the topic of virtualization and the Cisco Unified Communications Portfolio. This material is a subset of a presentation provided to the Cisco Mid-Atlantic Users Group in May 2011. This presentation covers topics around deploying a virtualized and unified communications environment using the Cisco UCS platform. We'll start with a high-level overview of how the Cisco UC solution has evolved and where the Cisco UCS platform comes into the picture. Next, we will go over the specifications for running a virtualized UC environment on the UCSB and C-Series platforms. Finally, we will discuss the UCS design and deployment considerations. The Cisco UC platform has evolved over the past two decades, starting with Voice over IP in the 1990s. The core use case for Voice over IP was linking disparate TDM PBXs over a packet-based network. As the name suggests, Voice over IP was all about the network. In 2000, Cisco began offering an IP telephony solution with CallMagic 3.0. This application ran on Microsoft Windows platforms, which remained the staple OS for all CallMagic 3 and 4 versions through 2004. Starting in 2005, Cisco launches version 5 of their IP telephony application and rebrands the call manager as the Unified Communications Manager. This is a significant departure where we begin to see Cisco leverage a purpose-built Unified Communications Operating System, or UCOS, based on the Red Hat Linux. As we move along the timeline from 2005 to 2010, Cisco begins to leverage the UCOS for other applications, such as Unique Connection, Unified Presence Server, and Unified Contact Center Express. What should be noted here is that as we progress from the custom-built Windows OS platform to the purpose-built UCOS platform, we begin to increase architectural flexibility and operational efficiency. The net effect is that our UC solutions can be even more responsive to changing business needs and are more stable overall. As we look forward to running UC applications in a virtual environment, we continue improving on these themes while introducing additional benefits such as reducing upfront and ongoing operational costs, simplifying management, and increasing business continuity. So what are the benefits of running Unified Communications and the UCS platform in a virtual environment? Leveraging virtualization introduces an opportunity to lower initial capital expenditures because we have fewer servers, adapters, and cables to deal with. These benefits carry over to operational expenses because we can consolidate system management. We have a smaller footprint in the data center, and we simplify cable maintenance. Finally, leveraging virtualization in an intelligent way can increase our efficiency with provisioning and deploying new services. We can also take advantage of the inherent benefits of virtualization to introduce a new model for lower environment testing. What I mean by lower environment is an environment where we can test out features and applications before production deployment. As a matter of operational discipline, Netcraftsman always recommends that customers leverage a lower environment for developing skills and pre-production deployment validation. Virtualization represents an architectural shift in how we think of UC applications in our data centers. Without virtualization, we run the Cisco UCOS on bare metal servers. These can be Cisco MCS servers or customer-provided servers built to Cisco specifications. The UCS applications run on UCOS, and aside from the business edition of Unified Communications Manager, only one application can run on one physical server. The virtualized environment moves away from the idea of one application on one physical box. We still have physical compute components for I.O. operations, and these compute components are housed on a physical blade or UCS rack mount server. However, the server runs a hypervisor, which coordinates interactions between the compute resources and the virtual machines. For UC applications, the hypervisor is VMware ESXi. Virtual machines are a close analog to the physical MCS servers. Just like the MCS servers, the Cisco UCOS is loaded on the virtual machine and the UC application runs on top of the UCOS. However, with the virtual machine, you can run multiple VMs on a single hypervisor. The primary benefit is a reduction in the data center footprint your UC servers consume. Or, as I like to think of it, it's a fundamental reduction in the amount of metal, silicon, and copper you have to use to get your users to your application. There are four key advantages to the virtualized environment. The obvious benefit is that a hypervisor allows for logical partitioning of virtual machines. 
This allows multiple applications to run on a single physical server. This also allows for isolation or insulation. Each VM is isolated from other VM applications on the same server. The advantage is that an issue with one virtual machine should not cascade to other virtual machines on the same platform. One of my favorite benefits is that the VMs are very mobile. This is because virtual machines are encapsulated into files which can easily move around your environment. This can come in handy for business continuity purposes and for staging as well as testing. Finally, the physical server and compute resources are technically transparent to the virtual machine. The hypervisor provides an abstraction layer between the virtual machine and the hardware. This means that a VM can be moved to another physical server without modifying hardware drivers. Now that we have a decent feel for the benefits of virtualization to a UC solution, we should start looking at the MCS and UCS hardware platforms that are in play. The MCS platforms are alive and well. Cisco has a variety of standalone MCS server platforms to choose from. In order of resource scalability, we have the MCS 7816, MCS 7825, MCS 7835, and the MCS 7845. Cisco also has an MCS platform that supports co-residency. The MCS 7828 is a purpose-built platform that runs the business edition of the Unified Communications Manager and Unity Connection. For the Cisco UCS solution, there are two platform flavors. The UCSC series is a rack-mounted chassis solution with all compute services built in. There are several models, but from the UC perspective, we are going to focus on the UCS 210M1, M2, and the UCSC 200M2. As we will see later, the UCSC 210M1 is an odd offering since it is a standalone virtual machine. The C210 and 200M2 platforms both support UC application co-residency on a single platform. We can loosely map migration paths for the MCS platforms to these individual UCS platforms, though technically the UCS platforms are generally more powerful than their MCS cousins. We'll discuss sizing of systems later in this presentation. Next we have the UCS B-Series platform, which is a modular chassis solution which supports up to eight individual UCS blade servers. Now that we have a high-level overview of the MCS and UCS platforms, we are going to spend the rest of this presentation focusing on the UCS platform, starting with the UCS B-Series chassis. If we break the UCS B-Series chassis into its smaller components, we would find that everything starts with the compute resources. The compute resources are components such as RAM, network, video, and storage devices that are physically installed on the Blade server. The Blade server comes in two form factors, a half blade model such as the figure on the right hand side of the screen and a full blade model which is shown on the left. The half blade server is a two socket blade server that utilizes a single slot in the UCS blade server chassis. The full blade server is a two socket extended memory blade server that utilizes two slots in the UCS blade server chassis. The UCS5108 blade server chassis is a modular chassis which can house up to eight half blade servers or four full blade servers. This chassis can also house one or two fabric extender modules. The fabric extender modules provide network and storage connectivity to the chassis. The fabric extenders connect the UCSB chassis and the fabric interconnect. The 2104 XP fabric extender has four SFP ports that provide 10 gig E network and fiber channel over Ethernet connectivity. In addition to providing LAN and SAN connectivity, the extenders also manage the chassis environment, simplifying diagnostics, cabling, and management. Each UCS chassis can have up to two fabric extenders for redundancy. You can think of the fabric extender as a distributed line card for the UCS fabric interconnect. The Fabric Interconnect provides the management and communications backbone for the UCS B-Series blade servers and chassis. Fiber connections from the Fabric Extender are terminated on the Fabric Interconnect, which provides both LAN and SAN connectivity for all blades in the management domain. There are two Fabric Interconnect models. The 6120 XP is a 20-port system that can support up to 20 UCS blade server chassis. For those that are counting, that is 160 B200 blade servers. The 6140 XP is a 40 port system that supports up to 40 UCS blade chassis and 320 B200 blade servers. 
The UCS Manager is embedded on the Fabric Interconnect and provides a central point of administration for all compute resources. Putting all these pieces together, we have one cohesive integrated system that unifies the network, compute, and on initial launch, Cisco supported running UC applications on the B200 Half-Blade server, but not on the B250. The reasoning was that Cisco only allowed four applications on a single blade, so deploying a full-width blade would be a waste. Recently, Cisco has opened up this restriction, as we will discuss later in this presentation. On both blade server flavors, we have different model designations. Both flavors are two-slot servers, the M1, using the Intel 5540 and the Halem processors, and the M2 uses the Intel 5640 Westmere processors. When ordering the UCS B series for UC application use, you have the option of installing two internal SAS drives. These drives are used to load the hypervisor only. Cisco doesn't support running UC applications on direct attached storage, or DAS, when deployed on the UCS B series platform. Earlier we talked about reducing the cable management nightmare. As you may have inferred, this means that the Blade server itself doesn't have a forward-facing LAN or SAN interface. Instead, Cisco leverages the Converged Network Adapter, or CNA. The Cisco CNA M72KRE Emulex Adapter is a high-performance 10-gig fiber channel over Ethernet mezzanine card adapter that consolidates traffic for LAN and SAN traffic. Since I brought it up, it is probably a good time to talk about storage. We have only three basic types to get our mind wrapped around. Direct Attached Storage, or DAS. This simply refers to hard drives installed in the UCS platform. On the UCSB series, DAS is only used for the ESXi hypervisor, and the UC VM guests are actually loaded from a SAN. A popular DAS approach is SCSI. The I.O. process is pretty straightforward. The file system coordinates I.O. with the volume manager, which accesses the SCSI hardware via a device driver. I.O. operations cross the SCSI bus adapter to the appropriate SCSI disk. A storage area network, or SAN, is a storage resource that is located over the network away from the compute resources. Fiber Channel is a popular SAN protocol. The file system, volume manager, and SCSI device driver serve the same purpose as they do in the DAS model. The difference is that I.O. operations need to traverse fiber channel network. The local compute system uses a fiber channel host bus adapter to access the SAN. The last type we show on this slide is iSCSI, which is an IP-based storage networking standard for linking storage facilities. In essence, we are packetizing SCSI I.O. commands and sending them across an IP network. This approach increases distance capabilities, but also introduces overhead latency to the I.O. process. As with the DAS and SAN approach, the volume manager interfaces with a SCSI device driver. What is unique here is that an iSCSI driver is introduced to manage I.O. exchange between the SCSI device driver and the TCP IP stack. Another storage solution that we should mention is Network Attached Storage, or NAS. Like iSCSI, the NAS storage model uses your IP network to send files across the network to a storage server. The difference is that NAS relies on application layer protocols such as NFS or SMB. What this means is that the OS or application is aware that the storage location is remote. Unlike the other methods where the storage location is transparent to the application or OS. When Cisco launched the UC on UCS solution, they only supported fiber channel SAN storage for UC application. Recently, these restrictions have been lifted, as we will discuss later in this presentation. Continuing on our journey, let's look at the UCS C series platform. The C series is a general purpose one or two RU rack mount server. This platform is used for environments requiring geographic distribution of compute resources and has a wide range of compute resource options that can be tailored to meet specific needs. With the UCS B series, we talked about the UCS Manager. The C series also has an integrated management component called the Cisco Integrated Management Console. This management console facilitates remote monitoring and management of the compute platform. The UCS C series platform can be deployed using a local ESXi hypervisor, which can be managed with a vSphere server or client. In environments where there is a UC-only scenario or there is no existing SAN solution, the C-Series is a good fit. The C-Series platform has four models that we will discuss. The C200M2 is a one-rack unit system that is loaded with two quad-core 5506 processors and four SAS drives. 
The C210 M1 is a 2RU system loaded with two quad-core 5540 processors and up to 16 SAS drives. The C210 M2 is a 2RU system that can be loaded with two quad-core 5500 or 5600 processors, 16 SAS drives, and up to 192 gigabytes of RAM. Finally, the C250 supports two quad-core processors, eight SAS drives, and up to 384 gigabytes of RAM. The C250 was not originally supported on initial launch and is not part of the Cisco tested reference configurations that we will discuss momentarily. Now we have a 10,000 foot view of the UCS platforms that may be used in a UC deployment. We are going to take a tour of the specific compute configurations supported by Cisco. The challenges that the UCS platform offers a wide range of compute options that customers need to navigate through to piece together a platform that is UC ready and that conforms to the recommended support guidelines set by the Cisco Voice Technology Group. To address these challenges, the VTG developed a variety of tested reference configurations or TRCs. TRCs are UCS platforms built to specific VTG capacity and co-residency scenarios. The TRCs narrow the compute options down to specific server types and storage options. Ordering UCS platforms is also made easier by bundling options into a single Cisco part number. From an operations perspective, the TRCs are Cisco tested and approved, which means that there is application-specific documentation available and Cisco TAC personnel are trained on supporting the TRC bundles. In addition, the TRCs come with OVA templates which can be used to quickly create the virtual machine. There are two TRCs for the B200M1 Blade server. Both TRCs include two quad-core CPUs for a total of eight cores. Both TRCs also include 36 gigabytes of RAM and third-party converged network adapter. The difference is that TRC1 uses a local DES to load the hypervisor, while TRC2 supports a boot from SAN option, which requires ESXi 4.1 or later. It is also worth noting that TRC1 has a bundled Cisco part number. The UC application co-residency is supported. There are two TRCs for the B200M2 blade server. Both TRCs include two quad-core CPUs for a total of eight cores, and both TRCs include 48 gigabytes of RAM. The difference is that TRC1 uses a local DAS to load the hypervisor, and TRC2 supports a boot from SAN option. It is also worth noting that TRC1 has a bundled Cisco partner. The UCSC 200 M2 is equivalent to an MCS 7825i2 and is a configuration that only supports up to 1,000 users. The TRC only supports the use of DAS running the hypervisor and the UC application VMs. UC application co-residency is supported with up to four VMs per compute system. The UCS C210 M1 platform has three TRCs that are equivalent to an MCS 7845i3. TRC 1 and 2 are essentially the same with the difference being in the amount of RAM. TRC 1 and 2 are bundled packages that can be ordered from the Cisco parts list. TRC 3 is similar to TRC 2 with the additional support of running the UC application from SAN. TRC 3 does not have an associated VTG bundle. It is worth noting that TRC1 does not support application co-residency. You can only load one UC application on a platform. TRC2 and 3 both support co-residency for up to four UC applications. The UCS C210M2 also has three TRCs that are roughly equivalent to the MCS 7845i3. Application co-residency for up to four UC VMs is supported on all three TRCs. The difference between the TRCs is that TRC1 is a DAS only option with the hypervisor and UC application running on the local disk system. TRC2 uses DAS for the hypervisor only while the UC application can be loaded on the SAN. And TRC3 is a diskless solution that does not leverage a local hypervisor. Instead, the hypervisor and UC application are loaded from the SAN. On initial launch, Cisco only supported the previously discussed TRC models. In June 2011, Cisco introduced a new support model called the Specifications-Based Hardware Support Model. This means that customers now have three deployment options. The TRC model, the specs-based model where a UCS solution is customized to meet the UC application needs, and a specs-based model that supports using compute resources from select third parties. 
At this time, only HP and IBM compute servers on the VMware ACL are supported. Supported servers must also use the Intel Xeon 5600 and 7500 processors, and Cisco guidelines restricting oversubscription of compute resources still apply. In addition to expanding support to allow customers more flexibility in choosing the compute platform, Cisco has also lifted restrictions on storage support. Originally, only DAS and fiber channel stands were supported. Now customers have more storage options. Of course, customers need to ensure that the underlying network transporting iSCSI or NAS traffic is engineered to provide the appropriate end-to-end -end QoS. Co-residency restrictions have been enhanced to allow for more than four concurrent UC applications on a compute platform. However, co-residency is still restricted to only UC applications. On initial launch, the supported UC applications include the Communications Manager, the Communications Manager SME Edition, the UC Management Suite, Unity Connection, Unity, and Com Next, we're going to review the design and deployment considerations for the UC on UCS solution. There are many considerations and variations on what is and what is not supported. We're going to cover some of these at a high level. The good news is that Cisco has a very robust doc wiki repository on the topic, a link to which is provided at the bottom of this slide. First, VMware ESXi is the only hypervisor that is supported. The versions supported are ESXi 4.0, 4.0 Update 1, 4.1, and 4.1 updates. Cisco applications like Unity and Contact Center Enterprise started their virtual life supporting ESX, but Cisco is clearly moving away from this, which isn't too much of a surprise since VMware itself is leaving ESX behind. As far as licensing, Cisco supports UC application installs on all ESXi flavors, including VMware vSphere Hypervisor. However, Cisco recommends using its standard, advanced, enterprise, or enterprise plus. Customers can provide their own licenses, though keep in mind the VTG bundles do include a vSphere license. Cisco supports many of the ESXi enterprise feature set, but doesn't support every ESXi feature with every application. It is a bit of a puzzle, and is highly recommended to review the feature support matrix on the doc wiki. Some key features that are supported include, but are not limited to, high availability, site recovery manager, vMotion, and boot from SAM. Not all features are supported equally across all applications. For instance, boot from SAM is not supported on the uni unified attendant consoles, nor is it supported on the UC management applications. And some applications only support vMotion in maintenance mode, while others don't support it at all. As one would expect, co-residency is supported, but Cisco limits co-residency to require all VMs on a single hypervisor to run an improved Cisco UC application. With the tested reference configurations, you can get up to four UC application VMs on a single blade or rack mount server. Using the specifications base model, you can get more than four VMs as long as you ensure that each application has one-to-one -one parity between virtual CPU and the physical CPU cores. You also need to make sure that physical memory is equal to 2 gigabytes, which is needed for the hypervisor, plus the total amount of virtual RAM assigned to all VMs. A virtual machine can be typically thought of as a physical MCS from a sizing standpoint. However, when considering sizing a VM, keep in mind that capacity is measured in terms of virtual compute services, and while a VM on a UCS can have much more horsepower than an MCS, this does not equate to higher capacities at least not yet. The Cisco voicemail applications bring a little special spice to the party. Uni connection guests on the UCS platform require a dedicated CPU core for the ESXi scheduler. If you have more than one Uni connection guest on a single platform, a single core can be used for all Uni connection guests. Unity requires CPU affinity, which means a strict mapping of CPU cores to the Unity virtual CPUs. On the slide, we have the various applications which support UC virtualization. Again, it's a good idea to go to the UC virtualization doc wiki to get the latest information on TRC and VMware feature support. In the call processing arena, we have the usual suspects, Unified Communications Manager, Unified Communications Manager Business Edition, and the SME Edition. We also have CER and various Unified Attendant Console applications. The UC Management Suite is supported as is Unity, Unity Connection, and unified presence. 
not to be outdone, the Contact Center BU comes in with the Express and Enterprise versions of their products. Next, we want to touch on the application design considerations. In essence, nothing has changed. If you write it in the SRMB, it applies to real and virtual environments alike. All of the various UC application features such as high availability, redundancy, and scalability still use the same rules. For instance, Unified Communications Manager still has the same restrictions on design elements such as the number of nodes in a Communications Manager cluster and the rules for clustering over the WAN. Some things that may not be obvious are that you can mix real and virtual servers in a cluster. In fact, for Unified Communications Manager, you have to consider this model if you require live music on hold streaming, for example, satellite radio. You also have to exercise some common sense rules that aren't enforced, such as loading all of your VMs on a single compute platform. Not a good idea. Before we get into some design examples, I did want to touch on the Open Virtualization Archive, or OVA, templates. Cisco has been nice enough to build VMware OVA templates for UC applications that are supported in VMware. Actually, Cisco requires you to use the OVAs if you wish to deploy a Cisco-supported configuration. The OVAs contain virtual CPU, virtual RAM, and virtual storage parameters, along with other key configuration elements. One of the most important elements is that the OVA contains a virtual hard disk with pre-aligned disk partitions. Using the OVA is the only way to deploy the UC application on aligned disks. Bottom line, use the OVA, since it is the only way to guarantee that the configuration of the virtual machine is correct and supported. Now we want to wind down the presentation with some design examples. The first example is a small site with 500 users and 25 contact center agents. Assume we want to have a CUCM cluster with at least two nodes, a union connection cluster, and a contact center express server. As always, we have several options. One option is to load all of these apps on a single UCS C-series chassis. As you can see, we have eight CPU cores, and we've allocated our CPU cores as follows. One to each Unified Communications Manager node, one to each Unity Connection node, one for all the Unity Connection VMs on the chassis, which is used for the ESXi scheduler, and two cores are allocated for Contact Center Express. Assuming we have the proper memory loaded, there's plenty of capacity to meet our requirements. We can also begin to see some of the benefits, such as two RUs versus six or eight, and a net reduction of five servers to one. But there is something wrong with this picture. Can you spot the downside with this approach? The obvious problem is that there is a single point of failure in the form of one lonely UCS platform. Certainly we can do better. In option two, we add another UCS platform. Again, each chassis has eight CPU cores, and we allocate the CPU cores in the same manner as option one, with two notable additions. Each compute server that is hosting at least one CUC node must have a core dedicated for the ESXi scheduler. We have also added an additional communications manager called processing node. We can take advantage of this platform to have physical and spatial redundancy for our call processing and messaging applications. We can also throw in another call processing node to incre increase the robustness of our communications manager cluster, and we have growth capacity built into the system for future application expansion. Not to mention, we still have a good consolidation ratio of six servers to two, and we have squeezed six. For our next example, let's look at migrating an existing MCS deployment to the UCSC series platform. Our community is a 5,000 plus station deployment. We have two geographically separate data centers on a single campus environment with high availability built into every application. Specifically, we have a unified communications manager cluster with one publisher, two TFTP servers, two subscribers, and one music on hold server. We have a CUPS cluster, a unified presence server cluster with one node located in each data center. We also have Contact Center Express deployed with a high availability option. Uni Connection is deployed in a cluster configuration to support 5,000 mailboxes. Finally, we have a CER cluster to handle E911 calling. One approach is to deploy four UCS C-series platforms, two in each data center. In data center one, we can achieve a 72 server consolidation and take 16 RUs down to six. We also are keeping one of the MCS servers 
been using it for music on hold since we have a dedicated satellite radio feed. In Data Center 2, we can achieve a 6 to 2 server consolidation and we can reduce the RU footprint from 12 to 4. So, what were some of the design choices? In this scenario, I'm using a C210 M2 and TRC number 1. For Unified Communications Manager and Unity Connection, we can run 8.02, but I'd recommend 8.51 or later. For CER, Contact Center Express and CUPS, we want to run 8.5 or later. The last two topics we want to touch on are management and licensing. UC applications are managed in the same way as they've always been, with one major consideration. In a virtual environment, the hardware is completely transparent to the UC applications. If you run a few show commands on CLI, you will see what I'm talking about. So you need to rely on VMware and UCS platform tools to round out your management solution. On the B series, you can use UCS Manager as we discussed earlier. And on the C series, you can leverage the integrated management console. From a VMware perspective, you can leverage the vSphere client, which is a thick client that can be ran on a Windows machine, or you can use the vSphere client with the vCenter server for a centralized and highly scalable management solution. Licensing is now way more entertaining than it used to be. At a high level, the process is basically the same. The difference is that the licensed Mac is no longer tied to the physical address of the NIC. That is probably due to the fact that there is no physical NIC. So where does this leave us? With no less than 10 host level attributes that are passed through a hashing algorithm to generate a virtual MAC address. By itself, that isn't a huge deal. What you want to be aware of is if you change any single parameter, the hash is no longer valid and you are now entering a 30-day grace period before things go sideways. In these 30 days, you can send the new license Mac information to Cisco to get new license keys. You can load them and you're back on track. If your 30-day timer threatens to expire, you can change the parameters back to their old values to reset the time. Nice. In this presentation, we have covered a brief history of the Cisco's UC evolution. We have also reviewed benefits of virtualization and the key attributes of the UCS B and C series platforms in a virtualized UC environment. We discussed the various Cisco guidelines and tested reference configurations, and we rounded out our topic with a few examples to illustrate key design considerations. Thank you for taking the time to sit through this presentation, and I hope you have a great day.